All right, it's been a long time since I put up a podcast. I was supposed to put one up Sunday. Of course, life got in the way. Things came up. I couldn't do it. It's Tuesday morning. I got in here and knocked one out. So I'm going to shut my mouth, and we're going to start into this podcast. I've got six or seven pretty good stories in this. The last one is pretty odd. I will say the last one is kind of strange. It's a Bigfoot story. But I hope you enjoyed all the same. All right, here we go. Okay, I have a bunch of short stories that I had pushed aside because they needed editing. And my editor, Miss Neoma Finn, has been busy with her channel. And she should be. She should spend time on her own stuff instead of messing with me. But these were all shoved to the side because they needed editing and they're, they're hard for me to read. But I thought, well, you know what? I've got about a half a dozen here. I'm just going to pull up and struggle through them. So if you guys are okay with that, just just hang with me. I may stumble. I may have to reread a sentence or try to figure out what the writer's saying. Because And I'm coming at these cold. I haven't read through them. I just know they were off in a folder that says needed to edit. Shorts needed to edit. So the first one is a short one from a man who doesn't want his name revealed. He says, I'll start off by saying I'm 43 years old now, and I'm a man who has spent a lot of time in the woods. I love hunting and fishing, and I've always loved camping, and I really love the quiet nights in the woods. This is my story. When I was 14 years old, I was out deer hunting on the first day of the season in West Virginia. By God, West Virginia. By God, West Virginia. My tree stand is in a humpback between two hills a hundred yards from a field. It was just about daylight when I pulled a couple of biscuits from my pocket. They had homemade jam on them and my grandmother had made them. Do y'all remember that? When I was young, 12, 13, 14 years old, me and my granddaddy would go hunting and it'd be cold. Man, it'd be so cold. And I'd walk out that door to get in the truck and my grandmother would stop me and she'd go, here, you, here's you something to eat if you get hungry. And she'd shove a couple of biscuits in my pocket. Of course, by the time we got to the woods, I had them already eaten up. I, they, they weren't like a later snack. They were biscuits and they were cold. They were left over from the day before. Those people were from the Depression. They saved all their food and she would just shove these one or two cold hard biscuits and I'd eat every bite of them. Every bite of them. Anyway, I digress. He says, I was watching the squirrels play around me and when I finished eating the biscuits, I took a drink from my canteen and I noticed that the sounds of the woods had gone quiet. It was a real eerie silence. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw something moving down the hill to my right. It gave a small growl, and then it moved further down the hill. Somehow, whatever this creature was had gotten past me without making a sound other than that low growl. I know that I saw it standing there, and I could only see its back, but it was massive. I would guess between four and four and a half feet between the shoulders. I've never told anyone this story, and I've hunted everything from squirrels to black bears. I've never seen anything like this before or since. I stayed in my tree stand all day until late evening, not really sure where this thing had gone. I didn't go back into those woods and hunt for the rest of the season. I'm sorry if this story doesn't have much information, but this is what I saw that day, and I'll never forget it. Thanks for taking the time to read this story. If you don't mind, I'd like to stay anonymous because of my job. Thank you and God bless you. Keep the stories coming. I love hearing from everyone else through your channel. Oh, this is quite the common story. You know, these things, hunters see these things a lot. I get a lot of reports of hunters seeing them. They don't engage the, the Bigfoot doesn't engage with the hunter and the hunter just watches and these things walk off. And then they're left the rest of their life thinking about that moment and wondering what in the world that thing was. I love these little stories, especially these hunting stories. And it uh, it got a little nostalgic thinking about those biscuits. So that was a good one. I appreciate the writer for sending it. My name is Al. You can use my name. 
I'm a 73-year-old military veteran and a two-time cancer survivor who has been married to my wife for 48 years. I grew up in New Orleans, and now we live 20 miles north of Lake Pontchartrain. When I was 15, I had my first odd experience. As the oldest of four children, I was in charge. My father and mother were both at work. It was early in the morning and I was sitting at the kitchen table eating my breakfast. We didn't have air conditioning back then. We cooled the house the best we could with a big window fan in one window and all the other windows wide open. The shotgun design of the house, a common design in New Orleans, helped with the airflow. As I sat there next to an open window, a bright orange glowing orb about the size of a basketball entered through the window right in front of me. It circled the room at a very slow pace and then flew back out the same window. I was stunned. Seven years later, in August of 1967, my National Guard unit was at summer camp at Fort Chaffee near Fort Smith, Arkansas. About a hundred of us were standing around on the parade grounds just talking and getting to know each other. Small handheld transistor radios were very popular back then and many of us had them. We were listening to the local AM radio station out of Fort Smith when some of the guys started pointing up at the sky and shouting, What is that? We all looked up to see five arrowhead-shaped flying objects moving over us very slowly. They were all bright white and flying in a V formation. When they got directly over us, they came to a complete and sudden stop. In succession, starting from their right, each one would leave the formation. They would take off and perform all kinds of stop and go and zigzag maneuvers at lightning speed and then return to their formation. It was likely they were showing off and trying to say, look at what I can do. This went on for 15 minutes. Meanwhile, the radio some of us were listening to started broadcasting reports of UFOs over Fort Smith. When a military jet was set to intercept them, the UFOs flew off at a blinding speed. We all stood there dumbfounded by what we had just witnessed. Many years later, in May of 2012, my wife and I were enjoying a wonderful vacation with her brother and sister-in-law in in Sedona, Arizona. I had heard so much about Sedona being a hot spot for UFOs that I just had to spend some time checking out the night sky. I was not disappointed. We had a long day trekking around the area and we were all tired. By 10 p.m., everybody else had given up and gone to bed except me. I was sitting on the second floor balcony munching on a bag of chips and keeping an eye out for anything unusual. Off in the distance, I could see the flashing lights of airplanes as they took off and landed at the airport. Suddenly, not 50 feet away, an orange orb about the size of a basketball again approached from my left and stopped at eye level. I distinctly remember telling myself, Al, this is not an airplane. I glanced away for no more than a second to grab a chip, and it was gone. It seemed out of character for me to place more importance on grabbing a chip than watching the UFO. I'm the kind of person who would have glued my eyes to that orb, not looking away until it was gone. I can't explain why I did that, I sat there for quite a while longer, hoping to see something else, before I finally gave up and went to bed. In June of 2018, I was driving U.S. Highway 11 in Slidell, Louisiana, on a clear, cloud-free day, when up in the sky to my left, I saw something very large. It was a few blocks ahead, and seemed to be hovering over a spot directly across from my destination. It was a silver disc about the size of a dinner plate sitting just above the tree line. Coming from the back on each side of the disc were what looked like the contrails from a jet engine. These contrails were glowing white and curving to form a large oval to the rear of the disc. I could see right through the oval to the blue sky. Altogether, it was pretty massive. Once I reached my destination, I pulled over to get a better look at the object. 
I also wanted to get a picture. But everything had vanished, even the contrails. We have all seen these vapor trails from jet planes. Even when the jet has gone out of sight, they remain and slowly fade away. They do not instantly disappear. Since 2016, this has been an ongoing thing. One morning while showering, the water hit my hip and it burned like fire. I looked down and found four thin horizontal scratches. They were perfectly parallel, bright red, slightly raised, and about three inches long. Furthermore, they were at an angle that I could not duplicate by scratching myself. As I was dressing, it occurred to me that they would have been covered by my underwear. I checked, but there were not tears in the fabric. I had never seen anything like this before, and I had no explanation for how they came to be. Then, about three weeks later, again, overnight, four more scratches appeared, this time on my left hip. Eventually, the scratches faded, but became permanent scars. About every three or four weeks, I get a new set of scratches on one hip or the other, and no explanation for how they got there. We continue to be puzzled by these events. Not long ago, my wife awoke in the middle of the night to find me sitting up in bed. She said she'd heard me calling for help. I told her that I'd seen three four-foot-tall gray beings with big heads and large dark eyes standing at the foot of the bed staring at me. She assured me it was a bad dream and suggested that I go back to sleep. You know I've got to break and tell you guys about Yeti Bar Soaps. They have a new product out called the Predator Bar. Now I don't know a whole lot about it, but I think it's got a lot of colors in it, but it is unscented. I know some of the scents that are put in some of these soaps are... Well, let me put it this way. Some people just like to be clean without a scent on them, without a scent that the soap leaves, and that's what this is. It's great for hunters. It's great for people who might have skin conditions. Anyway, they get you squeaky clean. And if you'll go to YetiBars.net or YetiBars on Facebook and look at the all of the items that they have for sale, I think you'll find a soap that you will be real happy with. And if you'll use the code DC10 at checkout, you get a 10% discount. And all orders over $75 is free shipping. So order a bunch of it. Stock up on soap this week. YetiBars.net, YetiBars on Facebook, and the discount code is DC10. All right, here's a story or an email with a story from... I don't know how to pronounce her name. It's spelled D-H-A-N-A. Dana, Dahana, 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 Dana. I think it's Dana. I'm just playing. It's a pretty name. She writes, hello, my name is Dana, and I live in the Pacific Northwest in a small town in Washington. My husband and I have a story to tell that happened to us in 2015 in November. We had moved into an off-grid RV park alongside the Lewis and Columbia River in April of that year, and during the summer, we began exploring the wooded area behind the park. In the fall, I started having the uneasy feeling that we were being watched, but I never saw anything out of the ordinary. When winter came, we had stocked up supplies and were preparing to deal with the cold weather coming on, We would not go in the woods hiking around, but around the third week in November, we noticed unusual activity going on. The area got quiet, and I never heard so much as a frog croaking, and that's when I knew we were being watched. My husband and I were woken up to feel something large slap the side of our trailer from the back side. Our bedroom faced the woods, and it seemed that the woods amplified the sound. Then the sound of something moving around outside. Neither of us dared to step foot outside, nor would we allow our animals out. We could hear branches breaking in the woods behind us, and a little later we heard screams that would scare the bejesus out of us. This, unfortunately, was not the end, because whatever was out there terrified the dogs in the camp, and I heard more than one screaming as it was killed. 
That happened at least three nights in a row. The screams from this creature could be heard from near the river and would start from around 9 p.m. until 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning. We didn't sleep much during this time. Then the third night this creature came around again and this time it shoved at the trailer. My husband was alone at the time, so I only had this accounting for this incident, but it scared him to death. I came home from staying over at a friend's house and gave her a heads up. She was skeptical, but didn't outright call me a liar. That night, the whooping and screaming went on again and again, and I heard dogs barking fiercely. Pretty soon, a neighbor living on the other side of the park grabbed his gun and emptied a magazine in the general direction of where it was. I didn't return after that. There was one rumor that said bear tracks were found, but I doubt that was it. Bears don't scream and whoop. But the most bizarre and scary point of this whole encounter was when my husband and I and our cats heard heavy pounding steps that literally shook the ground behind our trailer. We also had a swampy area behind the trailer that filled whenever the heavy rains came. My cat went on guard duty during that time and would lay between me and the window. At any rate, my husband and I have talked to quite a few folks at the RV park, and the odd thing was none of them claimed to hear or see anything out of the ordinary. We still live at that park. We've heard no more unusual activity, but have gone into the woods only during the daylight. We look up at the trees, and it does not appear that something very large passed through there. High branches are broken, and large trees are toppled over, and right in the middle of the woods. That was enough, plus our experience, to make believers out of my husband and I. The end. Oh, wow, that's a good story. You know, the strange thing about that is... You have all this stuff going on around your <laughs> around your trailer, and I'm assuming that the uh, camper trailers, I'm sure they're fifth wheels or, you know, big box trailers, are probably fairly close together. I mean, you can probably see neighbor after neighbor, and all of this noise, all this racket, this thing slapping the side of your, your caravan or your trailer, and nobody else in the whole place has any idea what's going on. They don't They don't hear it. The thing doesn't slap their trailer, but you seem to know what this thing was, plus that premonition that you had of something watching you. You know, sometimes that sixth sense tells it all. This was a great story, Dana, D-H-A-N-A. I'm very sorry if I butchered the, the way to pronounce your name, but it's a, it's spell pretty. It's spell pretty. And I'm and, it, and I think it's Dana. All right. Well, thanks, Dana, for the email. It was really great. All right. Here's one from Michigan. The writer says, I grew up in a small town in southern Michigan. The name of the town was Cement City. I had to be around 11 or 12 years old. The road I lived on led straight into a dead end at Gate 3 into MIS, which is the Michigan International Speedway in Brooklyn, Michigan. Our house was four miles from the speedway. It was in the mid to late 70s. I have an uncle that is only three years older than me because my grandparents had a change of life, baby. Whoa. Anyway, to try to make a long story short, my grandpa and grandma and my uncle came to visit. My uncle and I went for a walk heading over to see one of my friends that lived three quarters of a mile from me. As we were walking, it was like the time stopped or something in the sky made it go dark. It's hard to talk about, but something happened that day to me and him. And I just talked about it for the first time a few months ago, but we both came to our senses. We were looking up at a spaceship hovering just above the treetop level. This thing was huge and it didn't make a sound and it slowly pulled away and like a flash it was gone. My uncle and I ran back to the house to find out that we were gone for over two hours and we started telling my father, mother, and grandfather what we had seen. They told us that we were making the story up and they said we were crazy and we had been hiding from them and they had been out driving around looking for us. Later that night, it was on the 6 o'clock news that there was a spacecraft hovering over the Michigan International Speedway and they had all the roads closed around the speedway, and our government tried to cover it up. 
I can't say what happened with the time. We never talked about it, like I said. Well, they just walk out the door, start walking down that road. This spaceship comes over. They lose two hours of time. They get back. Their grandparents are all hacked off because they've been out riding around looking for them. Now, that's creepy. That's a creepy story right there. Uh, <laughs> you're walking down the road and all of a sudden, I don't know, were they sucked up in the spaceship? I don't know. You know what? Very plausible. There's all kind of stories like this around. I really appreciate the man. His name is Ronald. He didn't tell me not to use his name. Ronald, I know I've had your story for a while. I kind of explained it at the beginning. But there it is, brother. There's your story. And it's a good one. This happened in the early 1970s in the small town of Piedmont, Missouri. There was extensive news coverage at the time. It began when we all started seeing lights in the sky. One was a huge ball, but it was too far away to gauge how big it was. Each night, we could all go to the highest point in our town and see the events unfold. We would watch as smaller balls of light drop from beneath a huge ball. There would be 15 to 20 that would come out and then zip around in all directions, heading off to who knows where. Then, sometime later, maybe 15 or 20 minutes, they'd all start coming back, first a couple and then a few more. We started calling the big ball the mothership. If the smaller ball sailed over our local radio station, it would go off the air. There was a lake about five miles from town, and they were seen coming out of that. These things were all over the place, but we never understood their interest in our town. One night, as we were coming back into town, we decided to drive through it and turn around at the feed store a couple of miles on the other side. As I was pulling into the parking lot, we suddenly saw a huge object floating up from the field behind it. We all jumped out of the car to see what it was. This thing was almost as big as the field that it was rising from. It had a dim glow so we could see that it was round. There were portholes all around with different colored lights. I tried my best to see what was inside, but I couldn't see anything. It was completely silent. We watched as it floated above the telephone poles. And then, with lightning speed, it took off and was gone in three seconds. Shortly after that, we moved to Kentucky, so we've never seen any other events. My mother, however, just told me a couple of years before she died of something she had witnessed. It wasn't long before her husband passed away. She had been visiting my brother and was in her car heading home when she saw something in the sky she could not identify. She had to stop and take a look. She said it was a see-through light cling wrap, but floating and moving like a flag would. It didn't seem to be in a hurry, it just moved slowly across the sky. We could never decide what it could be, but it was definitely something if anyone knows what this thing might be, please comment. I don't even know what to call it. I would love to know what it is. I wanted to share these stories with you and the audience, and I hope you've enjoyed reading it. You may use my name, and you can interview me if you like. Best regards, Anita. All right, here's a story from a woman in Ohio, and she wants to keep her name out of it. She'll tell us why at the end, but this is really an interesting story. So here's what she writes. I was listening to your March 4, 2019 YouTube video, and I thought I would share this experience with you. First, though, I wanted to tell you how much I, okay, how much I enjoy your channel. It's great. It's a wonderful mix of music and storytelling and information. It's nothing better than a good story. Y'all, I normally, the I'm reading these cold. I don't, usually I edit that stuff out when people say, oh, we love your channel, and because that's really not pertinent to the story. But I appreciate people writing it. I'm trying to stick to the point here, but thank you, ma'am, for saying that. She writes, I grew up on a big farm in southern Ohio in between Cincinnati and Dayton. It was a great place to be as a kid. The first time I saw this craft was in the early 1970s. It was on a ridge above a half-mile training track, and it was longer than one side stretch of the track. That would make it 600-plus feet long. It was a long cigar-shaped object, 
and glowed a soft pink lavender like an old neon sign. It appeared to be floating or moving in the pink-colored mist. The weather was warm, and the mist was just short of boiling under the craft. I could feel it deep in my body. It vibrated the air, but it never made a sound. I was barefoot, and I could feel the vibration even in the ground. It had portals the whole length of the craft, and the craft was close enough that you could see that it was lit up inside. It was a summer morning, and there were already lots of people at the farm. It was a commercial horse training and breeding facility. I remember thinking the craft was so amazing, but being even more amazed that no one else appeared to even notice there was something taking up most of the sky. And then it was gone. I moved to Florida, and in the 1990s, I saw it again. I was driving down a major four-lane highway in North Florida, It was a beautiful spring day, and I was driving with the windows down. I felt it before I saw it, and I was surprised by the emotional response to the memory. The craft was right above the telephone power poles and just as big and pink as before. Everything was the same except this was on a busy highway, and no one else was even hitting their brakes. Cam, this thing was a couple of football fields long and it vibrated in the air so much that it hurt your heart, but it didn't make a noise. It was absolutely silent. I pulled over into a ditch and sat there watching the cars driving by, and the craft was barely moving, and then it sped up a tad, and then it was gone. It didn't zip up into the sky or take a real fast approach. It was just gone. There was nothing in the news and no local gossip, 50 plus cars passed it and not one car hit their brakes, swerved, or appeared to even notice something the size of an aircraft carrier a few feet above the power pole lines. I wondered if maybe the reality was that they couldn't see it and not that they hadn't seen it. They just couldn't see it for some reason. Yes, I know, I'm probably not completely right in my head and I've had too many rather strange experiences in my life. However, if you set that aside, I want you to know that I am a professional, I'm a responsible, educated person, I have a family, and I have no desire to be considered a looney tune, looney bin worthy fodder. I'm sharing this with you, and I would prefer to remain anonymous, and you, there's no problem with that, man, but I love this story, and here's the thing. Uh, You know these Bigfoot stories, some people say, well, you have to kind of be chosen to see one. Could that be the same with some of these strange crafts that people see? Because this is uh, one of probably two or three I've read where people see these things in the sky. They're in a crowded area, and they're the only ones that see them. Nobody else is looking up. This thing, especially on the four-lane highway, must have been very obvious, would have been very obvious to anybody driving down the highway because she, she couldn't miss it. Nobody else sees it. What a weird deal. Now, there are some stories I read where people see these strange craft floating or flying in the sky, and everybody sees it. Everybody around them sees it, and they're all gathered around looking at it. I always refer back to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and it reminds me of that scene where everybody is... Uh, all these people, it's night, all these people are gathered on the side of this hill around the curve of this highway, and they know these things are coming, and sure enough, they come flying through and around the highway, and the police are chasing them. Do you all remember that? One of the police cars flies off through the rail and down a ravine. So, I don't know, it just kind of reminded me of that, but I just love this stuff. It's kind of, I don't know, it just sparks your imagination and it makes you kind of dreamy and wonder, filled with wonder, and that's that's what I love about these stories. So thank you, man, for sending this. I know you think you're not right in the head, but I think you are, and I think you saw what you say you saw. And maybe the rest of us just don't have the insight to see those things. Or maybe we're too busy to notice. Who knows? But I, I'm always looking for stuff like that. Anyway, thank you for the story. It was wonderful. All right, here's an email from... Well, he doesn't really say whether to use his name or not, so I won't. I won't. But uh, let's see here. 
Yeah, he, he doesn't say, so I'm just going to read it, but this is a Bigfoot story, and it's pretty good. The man writes, I stumbled across Dixie Cryptid on YouTube about a month ago, and I thoroughly enjoy what people are willing to share about their experiences with Bigfoot. I'm amazed at how much information is out there on this creature, and I'm intrigued by it. In fact, I've been intrigued by it since 1978, when I had my one and only experience. At that time, I was 15 years old, so here we go. All right, here we go. Back around 1977 or 78, I was spending an October weekend at my dad and uncle's hunting camp near the south shore of Lake Superior in the north central upper peninsula of Michigan. The camp was built by my great grandfather. As usual, there were a bunch of guys at camp, including my dad, my uncle, my grandfather, and their hunting partners. All of these men were World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam vets. They were big and strong and fearless outdoorsmen. When you shook their hand, you knew you had a hold of something. Our camp included 250 acres of heavily wooded and rugged land. Our neighbors to the east and north of us owned a couple of thousand acres, also the same terrain and woods. My father and my uncle were hosting our annual woodcutting bee for the upcoming November deer season and winter snowshoe hare season. I love the autumn up there with the crisp air and the colors and the smells. Sunday morning of that weekend was spectacular as usual. Grandpa had made a hearty breakfast like only his generation could make. I needed to walk it off and I asked Dad if I could go grouse and squirrel hunting before we started on the wood. He gave me two hours before I had to be back, so I loaded up my shotgun, put on my orange hat, and I took off down the camp road. Back then, the area was extremely remote, with only one country road. Our camp was a mile down a two-rut road off the country road. I swung south of the camp road and up into the hills that were covered with oak and sugar maple and poplar. I was hoping to jump a roughed grouse and maybe bag a couple of big gray squirrels. I had walked the land with Dad and Grandpa often, and I knew the lay of it. I had a compass pinned to my hunting vest in case I got turned around. There was no such thing as cell phones to call for help in those days. Back then, I was a tall and skinny kid. I was six foot one, but I could put the miles under my feet, and I still can. About halfway into the hills, I decided to take a break in my Uncle Charlie's seat in an area we call the Big Ravine, and as I sat on the side of the ravine, I could hear something coming behind me. Well, I swung around in my seat, and I got my shotgun ready, and over the hill came a red fox at a dead run. He came within 20 feet of me. Well, I didn't want to shoot the fox, so I just watched him slink through the forest. It was really cool and I couldn't wait to tell the guys what I'd seen. And then I wondered what had spooked the fox, as there was nobody around for miles or so I thought. Twenty minutes went by, and I felt rested enough to turn back north and walk over to a stand where I had seen a black bear while hunting recently. For about two weeks, I'd been baiting bear with fish scraps and such that I'd obtained from a local fish market in town. I figured it'd be great bear bait and bring them in, and it worked. My intent was to see if I needed to replenish my bait bucket, which hung about six feet off the ground, and the bait stand with more fish and snacks. And so off I went. I used another two-rut road on the property my grandpa maintained for walking. It was quiet walking because the forest had melted off the leaves and the ground was damp on the road. And I walked silently to my bear stand. I knew the route that I was taking, and as I walked over the hip of a small knoll where my stand was located, I could see the bait bucket had been pulled down. Well, this was a good sign, because bear were the only animal that could reach up and snap the rope the bucket was hanging from. Furthermore, I could smell something sour, which I figured was a bear, but black bear are nearly always nocturnal, and they only come out just before dark, and then they disappear before dawn. Big bears get big for this reason. I climbed up over the hip of the knoll and I moved silently in the damp leaves. 
And then I saw something big, black, and hairy over the bucket laying on the ground. It was on all fours. My first thought was, holy smokes, that is really a big bear, and in broad daylight. I could hear it rummaging around, which is why it probably hadn't heard me coming. Its hair and fur was kind of shiny. I wasn't thinking about anything but bear at that point, and I wished I had more than my 20-gauge pump with me. All of a sudden, this thing stopped what it was doing, and it lifted its head to look around. Well, I'd position myself to shoot if I had to, should the bear charge me. Well, this thing was huge. I had a good view of the back and side of his head, and I was wondering why his or her head was shaped pointy. It looked left and then right, and then was facing away from me. If I'd had my deer rifle with me, that would have been one dead bear with a funny-shaped head like that. Grandpa would have bawled me out if I'd have shot that bear and hauled me back to camp. And then I thought, man, this thing stinks. And then this thing must have sensed me, but it didn't know where I was. I was only 50 feet away. And all of a sudden it took off on all fours directly away from me. And I was thinking, what in the hell is this thing? It ran like a cheetah from the TV series Doctari. Bears don't run like that. And I'd spent enough time in the woods to know this. Anyway, I was standing there in amazement until I couldn't hear it running any longer. I wasn't the least bit scared. I was armed, and I knew Dad and the guys were at camp, so if I didn't show up on time, they'd come looking for me. There's no way anything could face those combat bats down and live to tell about it. I started my walk back to camp as my time was up. I had a good mile to walk, and I could make it back in time. And in a quarter mile, I made it back to the road and I wanted to be on that led back to the camp. But off to my east in the woods, I could hear something walking parallel with me. It would walk when I did and it would stop when I stopped. This went on for 300 yards. Whatever it was seemed like it was about 40 yards out. And at one point, I stopped and squatted down to peer under the brush. And I couldn't see it. And when I was about 300 feet from camp, I couldn't hear it anymore. In fact, I heard a chainsaw start up, which would have been the guys getting ready to start cutting wood. Well, I told the guys what I had experienced, the fox and the funny-looking running bear on my walk back, and they listened to me intently, but we had work to do, and so the weekend went on. I had forgotten about my experience for years until the subject of Bigfoot Sasquatch came on the news more and more. I hope you share my story. It happened just as I wrote it. I know what I saw and experienced it. And he he signs off. And uh, I've had this story since 2019, and I'm just getting to it. Uh, Actually, it was kind of, it needed a little editing, and a lot of these I kind of moved off to. But I'm kind of dropping that now, and I'm going to, since you all have kind of let me know you don't care, I'm just going to read these cold because they're so good. They're so good. And I've always tried to do a, as best as I could, a professional type of a podcast. But, you know, I'm kind of letting go of that a little bit because it doesn't necessarily, I think it makes the story better if it's well read, well written. And not that these people aren't writing these well, they're just not writers. I'm not really a writer, but I hire people that are writers to edit these. But I don't think it's, I'm starting to be, I'm beginning to think that that's not necessarily as important as getting these stories out. So the backlog is going to start getting whittled down. But this is a great story, and he had forgotten about it. He had forgotten about it until, you know, Sasquatch started becoming more popular uh, probably about 10 years ago due to the uh, popularity of the Internet and the way that people can share information. It's so fast now that people began getting interested in this stuff again. And tons of people are seeing these videos, not necessarily mine, some of them mine, but not necessarily mine. And they're going, you know, I remember when I saw this when I was 15 years old, just like this man did. And it all comes back to him. And thank goodness he remembered and and wrote it so we could all enjoy his story. So I appreciate the man sending it. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. All right, we got time for one last story here. This is from Jim and his son, Matt. 
The first experience I had with Bigfoot happened in 2010 when I was backwoods camping out by Angel Falls in Big South Fork, Tennessee. I was alone at the time. It was 3 a.m. and I woke to my tent being angrily shaken. The tent was low and so the ceiling was about a foot from my face. I controlled my breathing as my heart was climbing into my throat. Whatever was out there was completely silent. I didn't even hear it when it walked away. I had felt like I was being watched by something that day, but Bigfoot never crossed my mind. I would never considered that they might be in Tennessee at that point. I thought maybe it was a mad bear or something. I prayed that it would kill me by biting my neck and not drag me off chewing on me while I was still alive. It quit shaking the tent, and I eventually fell back to sleep, and that was the end of it. I didn't have a gun and this time I was lucky. My second experience happened in 2018 when my son Matt and I were prospecting gold in Coker Creek, Tennessee, north of Chattanooga. On the sixth night we were there, we woke to what we first thought were hounds chasing something. The sound of stomping feet was getting louder and louder, and we knew a herd of something was coming our way. I know what a herd of something can do. Once during Desert Storm, I was boar hunting in Turkey. The locals used pots and pans to run dozens of boars up the mountain toward us. Their hooves pounding the earth, sticks crackling under the onslaught, and bushes shook against the wave of animals that were coming at us. And I thought I was going to have to climb a tree to get out of the way. This time I had the same feeling. I stared at the front of my tent watching and waiting, and I knew they were coming to run over me. It grew louder and louder. It was like the beating of drums, and I sat there waiting. I never moved, and I fully expected to die. I asked myself again and again how in the hell a herd got loose in the woods, but somewhere in the back of my mind I also thought, this has to be drums beating. It grew even louder, and it came closer, and the animals were clearly large and heavy, but there was no sound of leaves being crushed or sticks snapping under their feet. And in addition, I didn't hear any snorting or breathing, just the solid, heavy pounding of countless large animals. I should have felt the ground shaking, but I didn't. I don't think they actually touched the ground. They went through us like they were invisible or like they were spirits. They never touched anything. It was only sound. We jokingly referred to them as the ghost herd for a long time, and I think they used sound to terrorize us. Matt heard them running individually across the creek earlier, and he speculated that maybe they all fell into step. He thinks there were about ten Bigfoot running together. He heard more than I did, and I had to get my breathing under control. Matt was looking out both sides of his trailer, and he saw nothing. Seeing nothing somehow seems worse than seeing a stampede of cattle. Later, we heard something bipedal run past. We were camped 10 feet from a creek, and this thing ran right up the creek bed. As it got closer, it got louder. The splashing and dredging of water as it ran through the creek was undeniable. Its strides were perfect and long, and it maintained the same jogging pace as it passed. That creek was three feet deep in places, and this thing never altered its pace. And then, just as it came, it slowly faded into the distance. We had speculated there for the previous six days. That creek was up to my knees in places. Whatever passed us had to have been twice that size to move so easily through the water. Matt thought that another three or four of them ran by at another point. And again, he thinks they did so in unison. These things are perfectionists and they are highly intelligent. They must see us as utterly stupid by comparison. Was that two feet? I yelled out of my own tent. Yeah, Matt answered. What about the herd? I said, well, I heard that, but just now that was two feet, right? Yes, he said again. I was so excited about how clear the bipedal runner was. I had finally confirmed that there was a creature out there that must be near 10 feet tall and capable of making that kind of stride with ease and grace. You might think bear or deer, but I know what I heard. It was bipedal and strong. 
It was a giant. From the time the herd came through to the point where we could no longer hear the single creature running up the creek was two hours. And during that time, the dogs we'd heard were sometimes quiet and sometimes chasing something. They'd chase something every night that we'd been there, but this was the first time they'd run through our camp. It wasn't all games, though, once we heard a dog get kicked and let out a wolf before it went silent. We think the Bigfoot picked it up and covered its mouth because we eventually heard it again at the other end of the creek. There were three dogs. One was the Alpha, and it sounded louder and it must have been larger and faster because it would catch up to them at times. We laid in our beds listening in fascination while we fought back our own fears. The next day we investigated. There were guests staying in a cabin a few hundred feet away. They said they had come out with their guns that night, not knowing what the hell was going on. I found a spot in the grass on the creek bank where the dog and the Bigfoot had their scrabble. I found the dog's prints, but there were no other prints at all. There were no deer, no bear, nothing. Were these things ghosts? My third experience with these things happened in July of 2021 on the Tennessee-Kentucky border. Three years had passed since the incident at Coker Creek. We were relaxed again and had forgotten all about what can happen in the woods. We built an ice fire in our camp and we ate a good dinner before going to bed. And at 3 a.m. I went out to relieve myself. I was making my way back to the tent and I saw red eyes shine. I had a red light on, so I gave it little thought. I entered the tent and jokingly said that we were being watched. We laughed about it and we went to sleep. The next thing I knew, I was being awakened by the roaring whoosh of the treetops as they were being shaken. These were not small trees. We live in the country and we cut wood to burn for heat, so I'm familiar with the strength of these trees. Whatever was shaking them had to be powerful. It wasn't something I'd want to wake up to while sleeping in a tent in the woods. So I woke up Matt and I asked him, what was that? He said, take out your earplugs. I don't want to, I said, joking. Now I was trying to be funny to alleviate the tension, but I really didn't want to believe what I was hearing. I felt like I was in another horror movie, but it wasn't a movie. The trees were 20 feet away from us and it lasted for five minutes before everything went completely silent. It was a new moon, so we were in pitch black dark. There were none of the normal sounds of the forest. Even the nearby creek had gone silent, as if they could turn off all the sound in the area. That was the most terrifying moment. We were desperately trying to get some kind of information, and it was giving us nothing. I remember thanking God that my neck didn't make any noise when I turned my head. That's how freaked out I was. We had posted four trail cams that day, but of course none of them were in our area. And I can honestly say, at 55 years old, this was the worst experience of my life. It was adrenaline mixed with fear of the unknown to strengthen my resolve to fight. And I knew I had to get control or I was going to have a heart attack. At least it would reduce my ability to fight. I didn't have a gun, but Matt had a twenty two pistol, and I held my headlight in my hand and ready to turn it on. This monster might be ready to jump my tent at every moment, and I was resolved to see it before it killed me. I had to see it, and twenty minutes passed as we sat in the heavy black silence. And then something floated by our tent. It didn't walk. There were no footsteps. It had a digital cricket sound, like three or four beeps, and it would start and stop. And Matt said under his breath, it's moving toward the camp. We had a fire there, and it was done at this point, and I heard it. Now what, I thought, an alien? I knew I couldn't allow it to terrorize me anymore, and I knew I had to maintain my strength to fight it by hand if I needed to, but I ignored it. When you're about to die, you get real. I lay down. When I hear myself begin to breathe audibly, I wake up and make sure I had my headlight in my hand and ready to turn on. And I considered the possibility of walking out back to back. Matt had his pistol, and then I decided if we laid still, it would have to make the first move. And that's how we held our ground. 
Matt told me when the first thing floated by us, it reached into him and tried to get him to vocalize. He felt like it was vibrating his vocal cords for him. He was really messed up and struggling. He said he'd held his mouth tightly closed because he was afraid it was trying to get his location. Our tent was between two large rocks, so I think we were hidden. I have to admit, it did feel as though they were messing with us. Matt also felt that he had to stop his own heart. He realized he'd been holding his breath and took a deep inhale. The amount of fear it was impressing on us made me angry. It wanted us to die. These things are not a joke or a fun hobby. You'd better be 100% in your spirit and beliefs before you go out at night to find them. And you'd better be ready to die. It helps if you've already had a near-death experience. I've had three. They help you learn to accept death rather than fear it. Sometime later, the sun began to rise over the horizon and the woodpecker spent an hour raising cane about something. We knew we'd made it through. The sunlight was like a rebirth. This was by far the most terrifying near-death experience I ever had. And later, when we returned to the house, my wife said that we were white as ghosts and she had to walk on eggshells for a few days to keep from freaking us out. We visit the area during the day now and we've begun gifting as therapy. And it's important to learn to get back into the woods to get over our fears. I believe that we are human, light men. We are divine men, the only creature that God has code signature in our DNA. Bigfoot and these 5D creatures can see the light in us, in our souls. If you're not spiritually alive, the light is dim. They won't mind killing a dead man, but they will back off of the strong-spirited man because he is right and they know it. Stan, do not fear. They know you are divine. But if you don't know that, then you are Bigfoot food. And that's the end of the story. And I admit that story was hard to follow. There's kind of no setup. You don't know where they are, what they're doing. It's just kind of to the point. But it was a story I got and it was written fairly well. It was enough to me to get through. But it's one of the few that I get that I really had a hard time following. I didn't didn't really know. It was hard to tell exactly what was going on throughout this whole story. And regarding the spirit, you know, the... I don't know what spirit he's talking about. There is, uh, I don't know, there's some kind of connection some people make with Christianity and these Bigfoots and God. And I don't see it. I don't see, I don't see any of that. Uh, Maybe there's some hidden codes in the Old Testament or something that talks about this. But uh, I tend to kind of shy away from that thinking. I, I have my beliefs. Maybe I'll talk about them someday, but... It's uh, it's just pretty logical stuff. Anyway, that's probably not the best commentary I could give to this story, but I really had a hard time following it. However, I wanted to share it with you because maybe some of you understood what was going on. I hope so. All right, I think that's going to wind it up. I appreciate you guys listening. I'm back on a regular schedule. And you'll see a podcast from me on a regular basis for the foreseeable future, I hope creek don't rise and the lord willing all right you guys have a good week we'll see you on the next one thank you